Today we have two eminent speakers who are uh, well known all around the uh, world about for their uh, excellent excellent uh, way of delivering lectures. The first lecture will be on management of acute heart failure by uh, Dr. Sabah Nayam, we called as the Sabah sir. Uh, he is a clinical uh, lead and senior consultant in multidisciplinary ICU at uh, MGM Healthcare uh, Hospital, uh, Chennai. He got a vast experience in critical care medicine being trained in uh, India, UK, Ireland and Australia and he has an enormous interest in uh, ECMO and adult uh, critical care uh, medicine and he is a great academician who is an active participant of ISCCM meetings and all. Uh, we welcome you sir and uh, over to you sir to deliver the question. Thank you. Shabha, sir. I'll share my screen now. Yes, yes sir. Are you able to see my screen? Uh, yes, sir. You're able to see. Okay. Right. Good morning, everybody. I am uh, Dr. Sab. I am an intensivist. My base specialty is anesthesia, and um, my most of my practice is intensive care. Almost like eighty percent, I practice intensive care, and twenty percent anesthesia. Uh, thanks for giving me this opportunity uh, to discuss about acute heart failure. Um, and the relevant management to acute heart failure. One second, sorry. My slide doesn't seem to be moving. Yeah, it's moving now. Okay, so uh, for the next one hour or so, I will be going through the definition of different heart failures, different types of heart failures, how they are being classified. And then once we understand the pathophysiology of heart failure, then we will dwell around how to diagnose heart failure, basically how to classify and then how to diagnose. And then quantification of the problem. Any patient who comes with a problem, you'll have to quantify them so that you get a better understanding of the disease and so that you also treat them better. And finally, the last step would be how to manage them effectively in such a way that you prevent uh, de-hospitalization and readmission to the hospital. So that will be our learning objectives for the next one hour. Now, the reason we are talking about heart failure is that there are millions and millions of patients in the world who suffer from heart failure, some sort of heart condition which eventually leads to heart failure. And because of this, the financial burden on all parts of the world, whether it is a developed country or a developing country like ours, the financial burden is very high. Now, what this leads to huge amounts of mortality and morbidity. Uh, there is data to say that almost 50% of those patients who are diagnosed with heart failure today will die in the next five years. And a lot of these patients die because they are treated suboptimally. Then the other bigger problem is when they are treated suboptimally, the risk of re-hospitalization, they come to the hospital, get treated and then go back home because of suboptimal treatment. Within the next few weeks or months, they come back to the hospital with a heart failure again. Now this leads to re-hospitalization and lots of economic financial burden on the family as well as the medical system. And lastly, these are patients relatively on the elderly age group that we see with heart failure. And they always come in with more than one comorbidity. So which makes the entire situation a little complex to deal with. Okay, let me jump into the definition of heart failure. Technically, it's been defined as the inability of the heart to pump adequate blood into the systemic circulation. Technically, there is no enough blood going, which means there is no enough oxygen going. Now, this has been the traditional definition of heart failure, but that is not it. What we are talking about here, that blood is not flowing forward from the heart, it's called as a forward failure. There is also an entity called as backward failure. Now, the problem is when the heart doesn't receive enough blood, there is congestion on the backside. So technically we're de dealing with the venous system not being able to drain blood into the heart. Now this leads to increased filling pressures and thereby leads to congestion. Now, if the left heart fails, it's congestion in the lungs. If the right heart fails, the same congestion happens in the systemic veins. So we're talking about congestion in the liver, congestion in the gut, congestion in the kidneys, congestion in the peripheries, peripheral edema, etc. Now, this is called as backward failure. Now, what is forward failure? Technically, the left ventricle or the right ventricle is not able to pump adequately 
not able to generate a stroke volume adequately and thereby the cardiac output is decreased. As a result, there is poor perfusion onto the forward system. Now, this leads to poor oxygenation and as a result, this is called as a forward failure. So, this is just an illustration to what I have just explained before. Technically, you can call a heart failure as a right heart failure or a left heart failure. Now, each of this right heart or the left heart can have a forward failure or a backward failure. If a right heart has a backward failure, which means the vena cava, the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava, which drains blood into the right atrium and right ventricle, does not drain effectively. As a result, there is a vena cava congestion of blood, which leads to congestion of all the organs which drain blood into the vena cava. I'm talking about liver congestion, I'm talking about gut congestion, I'm talking about congestion of the kidneys, I'm talk talking about ascites and peripheral edema. So technically, a patient who's got a right-sided failure will have congestion all across the body and as a result, profuse edema or anasarka, that's what we call. Now, the same problem when it happens to the left ventricle or left ventricle backward failure, Technically, what drains blood into the left ventricle? It's the lung. So, there is not enough blood that is being able to be drained through the pulmonary veins into the left atrium. Now, as a result, you have congestion in the lungs that leads to pulmonary edema. So, a patient with a left ventricular backward failure comes to you with pulmonary edema, which is nothing but breathing difficulty. Now, this is the backward failure for the left and right heart. And the forward failure for the left and right heart Right heart pumps blood into the left heart technically. So technically when there is a right ventricular forward failure, there is not enough blood reaching from the RV into the LV. And so LV stroke volume is compromised. The same happens with the left ventricular forward failure also. There is not enough blood going out of the left ventricle. And as a result, there is poor perfusion into the systemic circulation. Now, when the heart starts failing, irrespective of whatever the cause is, the pathophysiology is the same. The most important problem that happens is the heart starts failing. There is a stretch in the heart wall, which leads to the ventricular wall stress. Now, this is nothing but the oxidative stress. And as a result, the oxygen demand increases. But there is not enough oxygen coming. So the inflammation gets worse. And once the inflammation gets worse, there are three important organs which are affected as a collateral damage. One is the endothelium of the blood vessel. The second one is the kidneys per se. And the third thing is there is an extensive venous congestion. So it all starts with the heart and then it spreads to the other three parts, which is the vascular endothelium, venous congestion, and then the renal function. As a compensatory mechanism, what happens is the kidney tries to re the kidney tries to give the blood back to the heart. So technically, when the left ventricle or the right ventricle fails, there is not enough stroke volume. So the kidney thinks that there is no enough volume and it starts activating the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So as a result, there is sodium and water retention. This sodium and water retention, in fact, leads to increased intravascular volume and then stretches the heart further. Now, this is nothing but a compensatory mechanism for a poor stroke volume, but it can only happen for a certain period of time. The heart, the left ventricle starts stretching for a certain period of time and beyond that, it leads to an irreversible format called as LV dysfunction or LV failure. Ultimately, this leads to secretion of extensive brain natriuretic peptide, which is a marker of a cardiac failure. Now, some of the causes, which is very closely attached to the mechanism by which it causes failure. For the left side, you can broadly classify as systolic dysfunction or a diastolic dysfunction. Technically, a systolic dysfunction is something which leads to a forward failure. Here, there are two important problems. Either there is an impaired contractility of the left ventricle itself. An impaired contractility of the left ventricle, it's very easy to conceive. It can be a myocardial infarction. It can be just a transient ischemia like an angina or a chronic volume overload state like a mitral regurgitation or an aortic regurgitation or a cardiomyopathy, especially the dilated cardiomyopathy, 
which can be from viral, which can be alcoholic. There are many reasons for people to get a dilated cardiac myopathy. So technically what we are talking about is an impact contractility of the left ventricle. That leads to a systolic dysfunction and as a result that leads to post-stroke volume. The other reason for systolic dysfunction is an increased afterload. Now, afterload is an entity against which the ventricle has to contract. To a certain extent, it will be able to push blood against the afterload. But then when it goes beyond a point, the left ventricle has a dysfunction. Now, this can be caused by an uncontrolled hypertension. You are looking at blood pressures beyond 200 of systolic blood pressure here or in valvular problems like aortic stenosis, where the afterload is so high that the left ventricle is not able to push blood overwhelmingly high afterload. Now, this causes systolic dysfunction. When it goes to the diastolic dysfunction, technically you are looking at a heart which is not compliant. It's not able to accept the blood which is coming into it. This is diastolic dysfunction. So this can be caused by obstruction to left ventricular filling. Technically, in mitral stenosis, there is not enough blood coming from the left atrium into the left ventricle. So technically, the LV is not filling. The other causes is problems around the heart, like a tamponade or a pericardial constriction, which can be restricting the blood coming into the heart. So the ventricle is not as pliable. It's not as flexible as a result. It's not stretching enough to receive the blood coming into it. The other possible reasons would be a left ventricular hypertrophy. Just imagine a chronic hypertensive, somebody who goes to the gym regularly and works out vigorously. So the left ventricular hypertrophy is so big that the ventricles become very stiff and causes a diastolic disruption. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, restrictive cardiomyopathy, even transient ischemia can all lead to diastolic dysfunction. So technically, most of the diastolic dysfunction will lead to what is called as a backward failure. Here, the systolic function is largely preserved. Now, similarly, for the right-sided failure, the causes of right-sided failure are a little different. We can broadly classify them as cardiac causes of right-sided failure and the pulmonary causes of right-sided failure. The cardiac causes, usually the left-sided heart failure are more common. And over a period of time, if the left-sided heart failure is not treated adequately, the left ventricle dilates, the left atrium dilates secondly, then there is pulmonary venous condition, there is pulmonary venous hypertension, which is like just a pathophysiology of a left-sided failure. Pulmonary venous congestion, pulmonary arterial hypertension, ultimately it starts affecting the right heart. You end up having tricuspid regurgitation and then there is right ventricular dysfunction and the right atrial dilatation. So technically it all started on the left side and then there is a reverse pathophysiology which ultimately affects the right side because there is buildup of pressure backwards. Now, pulmonary stenosis is a condition which can cause right sided failure and right ventricular infarction. Now, these are the cardiac reasons why somebody can have a right sided failure. More commonly, you would see pulmonary causes for right sided failure. Um, the right ventricle technically has to pump blood into the lungs. When there is a problem in the lungs, then you get the condition called as core pulmonary. If there is pulmonary embolism or a pulmonary hypertension, like a primary pulmonary hypertension, the right heart finds very difficult to pump blood into the lungs and as a result, there can be right-sided heart failure. When there is long-standing parenchymal diseases like COPD, interstitial lung diseases, patients who have like chronic infections like tuberculosis or conditions like ARDS, whatever be the reason for the ARDS, patients go in for a right-sided heart failure. So this is nothing but uh, your popularly known frank Scarlett curve where the x-axis gives you an idea about the blood volume and thereby the pressure that builds up into the left ventricle. It's nothing but an LVETP, left ventricular end diastolic pressure. Now, in a normal heart, where you find this point A, this is the curve which depicts the normal heart. As the left ventricular end diastolic volume increases, that is the blood volume increases, automatically the pressure slowly increases. Now, with an increase in pressure, because the ventricle contracts effectively, the stroke volume also increases. That's why you see a curve of this slopiness over here. Now, what happens is in heart failure, 
as the left ventricular end diastolic volume increases for the same pressure over here between A and B. Now, this is a failing heart, the one at the bottom. For the same pressure, the stroke volume is much lesser. And when you try to increase the volume more and more as a result of fluid retention, secondary to the compensatory mechanism, the kidney tries to compensate, right? With the renin angiotensin and aldosterone system, sodium and water retention, increase in intravascular volume. Now, this left ventricular end diastolic volume and pressure keeps increasing, but that does not reflect on a huge increase in the stroke volume. It has just come from this point to this point. Whereas if it were a normal heart, for an LV EDP of here, your stroke volume would be here. But here, whereas in a failing heart, the left ventricular end diastolic pressure does not contribute much to the increase in stroke volume. This is largely the pathophysiology of the heart failure. Now, this is one reason where you want to introduce anotropic agents so that you increase the contractility and thereby increase the stroke volume. At the same time, you don't want to build up the left ventricular end diastolic volume too much. So you try to decrease the preload. That's what we are talking about. Preload is nothing but the LV EDP. So you decrease the preload, your chances of the heart failing is much lesser. Just an illustration to show you what happens when there is a left-sided heart failure. What are the signs and symptoms that the patients would experience? So technically, left side has a forward failure and a backward failure. When there is a backward failure, usually the blood which drains from the lung through the pulmonary system into the left ventricle starts congesting. So the venous return from the lung decreases. This leads to pulmonary congestion and this leads to alveolar edema. Once there is alveolar edema, it is very difficult to send the oxygen across from the alveolar into the pulmonary system. And as a result, the patient experiences dyspnea, orthopnea, or a paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. So technically, you're dealing with a completely wet lung, a pulmonary condition leading to hypoxia. And these patients typically present with a breathing difficulty. So that's pulmonary edema for you, which is the left-sided backward failure. When the same left ventricle goes through a systolic dysfunction or a forward failure, so technically blood is not pumped out of the left ventricle. This can be from an uncontrolled hypertension. This can be from a poorly contractile ventricles for whatever reason. The most common reason would be myocardial ischemia, myocardial infarction. Or if there is a severe aortic stenosis, there is not blood, enough blood leaving the left ventricle into the systemic circulation. This leads to poor oxygenation of the peripheral organs. I'm talking about the vital organs. Poor perfusion of the brain, poor perfusion of the heart, poor perfusion of the liver, kidney, and the peripheries. So appropriately, there will be signs and symptoms which represents the particular organ. If it is poor perfusion of the brain, this patient is delirious, a hypoxic brain, completely confused, oriented, and disoriented, irritated, and all that. So the brain doesn't get enough oxygen. If it is going to be the heart, you know what it is. Patient will have tachycardia, patient will have hypertension. Now, hypoxia of the peripheries, you have cold, clammy peripheries. Your capillary refill time is increased more than three seconds, and there is lactate buildup. So your lactates will almost always be more than two. A poor perfusion of kidneys leads to oliguria and raise in urea and creatinine. Poor perfusion of the liver can lead to ischemic hepatitis. You have elevated transaminases, transaminitis. So this is the forward failure of the left heart. Similarly, for the right heart, you can have forward and backward failure. Again, what drains into the right heart? When the right heart does not accept enough blood coming from both the superior vena cava as well as the inferior vena cava, there is congestion of the vena cava system. When there is congestion of the vena cava, all the organs which drains into the SVC and IVC, including the brain, the liver, the kidneys, the gut, the peripheries, your limbs, everything gets congested. So there is edema of all these organs because of the increase in hydrostatic pressure. So technically, we are dealing with a peripheral venous congestion. So with liver, there is hepatomegaly, that is called as cardiac cirrhosis for a period of time. The renal failure because of renal congestion, the kidney doesn't function well. So you have oliguria and increased urea. 
and then there is peripheral edema. You almost always have ascites and bilateral lower lip swelling and all that. So technically, this is the backward failure of the right heart side. But as the forward failure of the right heart, the right heart pumps blood into the lung and from there into the left ventricle. So technically, the left ventricle does not get enough blood. So technically, this represents the forward failure of the LV as well. So inadequate stroke volume and you have signs of poor perfusion of all the white lungs. So this is exactly the same as the LV forward failure. So these patients can be broadly classified into two categories, whether they have edema or not, whether they are warm or cold. Based on this, there is a combination of this. So this illustration has backward failure or congestion in the x-axis and forward failure or perfusion in the y-axis. Let's assume that this patient has congestion. So when a patient has congestion, there is edema. So we're going to call this patient as wet. Whether it's edema of pulmonary edema or peripheral edema, these patients are wet. When there is no edema, we're going to call them dry. Now this, belong, this belongs to the x-axis. In the y-axis, we're dealing with perfusion. When there is poor endogen perfusion, cold, clammy peripheries, increased capillary refill time, lactates and all that, we're going to call them cold. That's why they are called cold, cold, clammy peripheries. When the perfusion is going to be normal, we're going to call them warm. So when you put the cold, warm and wet, dry into categories, you get four combinations. Interestingly, these patients who present with acute heart failure, the most common combination is wet and warm. They present with some sort of edema, Either it's a peripheral edema or a pulmonary edema, and they are most of the times warm. And this category amounts to more than 90% of the patients who present with acute heart failure. That is one reason I'm dwelling upon this group. So, most of your heart failures who present with uh, an acute heart failure of whatever reason to the emergency department or intensive care, they present with wet and warm. They have some sort of uh, an edema, and almost always they are warm. Heart failure, again, a lot of times, you know, uh, we also deal with these patients as uh, part of our uh, patients who come in for some sort of anesthesia or intensive care, whatever. A lot of times they are previously diagnosed to have heart failures. That's why I want to give you this uh, classification of acute and chronic heart failure. So chronic heart failure patients are established heart failure patients. We know that for a period of time, these patients have had some sort of a heart failure. Because of treatment, either they have a very stable period or see that there is a slow but steady deterioration over a period of years. Now, these are chronic heart failure patients. They generally present to your OP or to your pre-op assessment clinic or some sort of procedure. And you have to be very sensitive to identify these patients because those patients who have been having a slow deterioration in spite of being on treatment are at a very high risk to have a major adverse cardiac event around the perioperative. Those ones are the acute heart failure patients are the ones that you deal with in the intensive care. Either they are new onset acute heart failure for whatever cause that has happened, most commonly an ischemic heart disease, or these are patients who have an acute problem on pre-existing chronic heart failure. And most of the times, these deteriorations are quite rapid. The chronic heart failure patients, those ones who typically present to you during a pre-op assessment clinic, uh, they can be broadly classified into three categories. The first category is, so this, this um, categorization or classification is based on the ejection fraction. So those ones with a left ventricular ejection fraction of less than 40% are categorized as heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So they are known to have a reduced ejection fraction, which is less than 40%. And then this MR is mid-range, heart failure with mid-range ejection fraction. These are the ones with an EF of around 40 to 50% technically. And there is also a category of patients with heart failure who have an LV ejection fraction of greater than 40, greater than 50%, excuse me. So we traditionally had this belief in the past that ejection fraction is one entity which tells you whether there is a heart failure or not. It's, it's not valid anymore. So heart failure 
can exist with ejection fractions ranging from less than 40% to greater than 50%. Just because your left ventricular ejection fraction is more than 50% doesn't mean that your patient does not have failure. You can have a, a diastolic dysfunction and as a result, a backward failure. In these patients, diastole is, is the problem, not the systole. So your ejection fraction is a quantification of your systolic function, not your diastolic function. So you can still have patients with a diastolic heart failure, with a normal EF, maybe even 55-60%, but they can still be in failure. If you look at signs and symptoms, they have signs of backward failure. They may come in with pulmonary edema. They may come in with peripheral edema. They may come in with raised BNPs. All these are markers of cardiac failure. You look at the ejection fraction, it can be greater than 50%. So that is one reason this third category has come into play called as heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Now, these are the classification for chronic heart failure. And it's very important for you to understand this because these are the patients who present to you for pre-op assessment. And it's important that you are sensitive, that you identify what kind of failure they have. And based on that, your perioperative management can be a lot wiser. Okay. Um, what we are going to tell well around here for the next maybe another half an hour plus is acute heart failure. So usually these patients come into you with a new presentation or worsening of their chronic heart failure. When they present to you, these acute heart failure patients can only present to you in four different ways. And these are the four different categories. It can be an acute decompensated heart failure. Technically, these are chronic heart failure patients with an acute decompensation. These are most of the times documented chronic heart failure patients. That is the acute decompensated heart failure. The second category of patients are the wet category, acute pulmonary edema. So technically you, can, you deal with the patient who is coming with a breathing difficulty. So this is acute pulmonary edema. And the third category is isolated right ventricular failure. Most of the times it can be due to ischemia or could be due to a core pulmonale, secondary to a lung problem, like a pulmonary embolism, where you have an isolated right ventricular failure. And lastly, those patients who present you with a cardiogenic shock, a complete failure of the heart with a very poor perfusion as well as pulmonary edema. Now, the reason the patients with acute heart failure have been categorized into four different categories is based on the type of failure the treatment varies, the prognosis varies as well. And the etiology for these four different categories are also different. So it is very important that you identify what kind of presentation these patients with acute heart failure have. So in the acute decompensated heart failure, the most common mechanism is fluid accumulation. And as a result, there is increased ventricular pressures, the left ventricular end diastolic pressure increases as a result. They are always wet and warm. They are wet because there is a backward failure, there is pulmonary edema. And almost always they are warm because the forward flow is not compromised much. The perfusion is not compromised much. In this category of patients, diuretics plays the major role. Those patients with acute pulmonary edema, the problem is, again, a left ventricular failure, which leads to an increase in the left ventricular end diastolic pressure. And as a result, there is pulmonary congestion. And as a result, there is pulmonary edema. And these patients are almost always wet and warm, very much like the acute decompensated heart failure. And the treatment is diuretics and vasodilators. Isolated right ventricular failure. And again, uh, the common would, most common cause would be a lung-related isolated right ventricular failure. And uh, I will also go into an algorithm going about how to treat these patients. So let me not uh, well around the management of these individual failures here. And last category is the cardiogenic shock, where there is a profound systemic hypoperfusion. And these patients are very difficult to treat because they are both wet and cold, which means there is both failure of uh, relating to congestion, whereas there is pulmonary edema or peripheral edema, and also failure of perfusion where the end organs are not perfused well. Now, when these patients present with an acute heart failure, this is just a standard algorithm on how to work them up. For any patient presenting 
with any problem to your ICU or emergency department, uh, you go about in a systematic way. History, clinical examination, investigations, and then plan your treatment, right? So the first three are very, very important. So these patients as well, take a careful history, examine them very carefully, and go about investigating them with some of these investigations. An electrocardiogram, pulse oximetry, echocardiogram of the heart, that's a transthoracic echocardiogram. Initial laboratory investigations. Uh, I'm talking about investigations like CBC, renal function test, liver function test, and uh, uh, pro BNPs, chest X-ray, lung ultrasound, and depending on what the patient's history and clinical examination is, whatever specific evaluation you want to have. BNP is a very important test over here because a BNP can technically rule out a cardiac failure if it is within the normal range. So it has become a gold standard for those patients who come in with signs of failure. You do a BNP or an NP pro BNP and if your BNP values are more than your uh, baseline, your reference values, uh, you can almost always rule in a heart failure. And if it is within the normal range, less than the normal range, you can rule out the heart failure. These are some of the investigations. And these investigations, again, um, can give you an idea both about the cause of the heart failure as well as the effect of the heart failure. As the cause of the heart failure, the ECG can tell you if there is any ischemic changes. Your echocardiogram can tell you whether there is any mechanical or obstructive changes, whether there is a regional wall motion abnormality, whether there is a tamponade around the heart. All these can be revealed by an echocardiography. And the other investigations like a chest x-ray or a lung ultrasound will give you an idea about the effect. If there is a backward failure, pulmonary pump. If there is going to be a poor perfusion, you can have an altered liver function test, altered renal function test, your lactate, your ABG will give, give you an idea about the perfusion. And, uh, you know, so there are many things that uh, gives you an idea about either the cause of the heart failure or the effect of the heart failure. These are some of the investigations which are regularly done for those patients who present with a heart failure. Um, I am saying that those patients with chronic anemia can present with a heart failure. Thyroids, uh, thyroid function test will give you an idea whether this patient has got a heart failure secondary to hypo or a hyperthyroidism because both can cause D-dimers gives you an idea about the patient presenting with a pulmonary embolism, procalcitonin. You know, mm -hmm. sepsis is um, a very close mimicker of heart failure. So you would want to know whether there is any markers of sepsis. Lactase gives you an idea about the endocrine perfusion. So all these tests are dar targeted towards one thing, whether it is a cause or the effect. Now, based on the history, clinical examination and investigations, you qualify these patients in one of the four categories. The first category is the acute decompensated heart failure. Now, these are patients who typically present with congestion, that is wet. So, you have to go about and treat the congestion first. But before that, based on your clinical examination history, you need to understand whether there is hypoperfusion, whether the patient is cold or warm. If the patient has got signs of hypoperfusion, yes, then you need to have a combination of loop diuretics, which is most commonly used loop diuretic in this condition is furosemide. Some people also use torsemide. Um, so I, a combination of loop diuretic, and because there is also hypoperfusion, that is poor perfusion, in addition to pulmonary or congestion, we add an inotrope. So for these patients with both congestion and hypoperfusion, it's a combination of diuretic and inotrope. And then you evaluate the patient. Look at the hypoperfusion and congestion during your evaluation. Then if it continues to be there, then you need to have medical, you have to optimize the medical therapy. Whereas there is no relief of symptoms. Your hypoperfusion and congestion is not relieved. Then you can go about and add vasopressors to this combination. Now, usually this combination helps, but when this combination of diuretics, inotropes and vasopressors do not help, then you start thinking about further support. Here at this point, you have deemed that your pharmacological therapy with the diuretics, with the inotrope and with the vasopressor like a noradrenaline has not helped. So the next step is going about for a MCS, which is nothing but mechanical circulatory support or mechanical cardiovascular support. And 
you can also think about renal replacement therapy basically we are talking about dialysis at this point because you idea is to try and get the preload down so you introduce the diuretic to get the preload down if the diuretic is not working then the only other way to deal with this try a renal replacement therapy to get the extra fluid off so this is the algorithm for those patients who come in with a combination of congestion and hypoperfusion if the same patient has only congestion there is no hypoperfusion the only drug which is recommended is a diuretic because we are only treating pulmonary edema a diuretic alone is enough if there is congestion relief yes you go on ahead and optimize the therapy but in spite of being on diuretic the pulmonary edema exists there is a recommendation to add a second class of diuretic so the first class is always a loop diuretic either a furosemide or a tolosemide and along with that a thiazide diuretic has been recommended now this is the recommendation from the european society of cardiology if this patient has a diuretic resistance or the patient is an end stage renal failure patient who anyway does not make much urine then you will have to think about renal replacement therapy or dialysis to get the fluid out now this is the algorithm for an acute decompensated heart failure the next category of presentation of acute heart failure will be those ones with pulmonary edema um now in pulmonary edema most of the times the only problem is pulmonary congestion hypoxia and straight forward it's very easy to say that the answer would be a diuretic now the thing is a lot of times when you give a diuretic it takes some time to act you give a furosemide bolus now and for you to get a decent urine output let's say you got a nasty pulmonary edema you want at least 1 liter negative to achieve that 1 liter negative it may takes 5 to 6 hours time maybe even longer and this is with a patient who responds very promptly to furosemide there are many occasions where the patient come in with some sort of a chronic kidney disease they don't make as much urine as they want to and you don't get an immediate relief so that is where the addition of vasodilators the addition of inotropes the addition of niv comes into play where you get an immediate relief from the problems that the patient presents with so here patient presents with pulmonary edema now the most important treatment that you want to initiate is oxygen in some form the oxygen can be started right from nasal prongs to face mask or you can use a non invasive ventilation or the patient is extremely sick the ultimately if nothing helps after niv the escalation is for intubation and ventilation this is the appropriate oxygen or ventilatory support now the next thing is you need to look at the systolic blood pressure if the systolic blood pressure is greater than 110 your pressures are decent then you can think about adding vasodilators but technically what you want is preload reduction for the diuretic to give you a preload reduction it may take a few hours so if you add a vasodilator like an ntg or sodium nitroglycerin the vasodilation is immediate it happens within the next few minutes and the preload reduction is also very prompt and you can get an immediate relief potentially that is the reason they are asking you to look at the systolic blood pressure and if it is more than 110 you have the option of adding a vasodilator so well, it's a combination of a diuretic and a vasodilator for those patients with a good blood pressure now if the blood pressure is not good there are all signs of hypoperfusion that is hypoperfusion as in poor endocrine perfusion with raised lactates cold clammy peripheries poor perfusion to the kidneys leading to oliguria here in addition to the diuretic they are asking you to add inotrope and vasopressor which increases the contractility which causes vasopressor effect to a certain extent so that the perfusion is streamlined in this category of patients it's a combination of diuretic and a vasopressor but if there is no signs of hypoperfusion and the blood pressure is also not 110 then it's okay you can just add the loop diuretic alone for these patients like you know, what you would normally do for pulmonary edema and wait for the response if there is a good response you optimize the medical therapy and continue care but again if there is no good response the final common pathway is pharmacological treatment has not helped so you go ahead and look for mechanical treatment like mechanical circulatory support or a renal replacement therapy basically you're introducing machines along with the pharmacological agents but this is the guideline for treatment of pulmonary edema 
right ventricular failure. Right ventricular failure is quite unique in that it's not very common, number one. And almost always there is a cause, which means that the most important treatment for this problem is treat the cause. So once you treat the cause, which can be a pulmonary embolism, which can be a core pulmonale, which can be an acute coronary syndrome, like basically an ischemia where you have to revascularize, almost always it improves. But in case this is a chronic right ventricular failure, which is not improved, obviously it leads to market congestion. And the most important treatment for this problem is diuretics. These patients present with lots of peripheral edema, lots of congestion of liver, kidney, gut, and as a result, symptoms relating to that particular organ system. A GI congestion leads to poor oral intake, and as a result, poor bowel habits. A liver congestion leads to uh, congestive hepatomegaly, congestive hepatitis, and long-term cardiac cirrhosis. So the most important treatment for this is loop diuretics. If in case these patients also have signs of poor perfusion, which affects the forward flow as well, automatically we introduce inotropes and if there is a need, we may also have to introduce vasopressors for these patients. So ultimately, if there is a combination of congestion as well as poor perfusion, that is poor forward flow, you add diuretics for the congestion and you add vasopressors and inotropes to augment the forward flow. If there is relief of symptoms, well and good, you continue management. If there is no relief of symptoms, then the only way to go forward is introduce machines like the other problems. Right ventricular assist device is nothing but RVAD. It's a very uh, novel treatment, which is uh, a temporary treatment, obviously, for a lot of patients until the patient is eligible for a heart transplant. Right ventricular assist device, which helps the right side alone. Um, or a renal replacement therapy, if we can remove fluid, decrease the preload for the RV and see if we can optimize. This is for the right ventricular failure. The last category of acute heart failure patients is the cardiogenic shock, wherein this is a dreaded combination where patients present with both wet and cold phenomena. Wet as in they present with edema, either pulmonary edema or peripheral edema, and they are also cold. Perfusion is also compromised. Again, here look for the reasons for a cardiogenic shock. If there is something reversible, like an acute coronary syndrome or some sort of a mechanical complication, then go ahead and treat the cause because without treating the cause, almost always they are not going to improve. But then, if these are patients with no identifiable cause, then you have to go for support to management. Number one, these patients are wet, so they are hypoxic. So introduce oxygen or ventilatory support, number one. Number two, these are cold patients as well, poor perfusion. So have to introduce inotropes and vasopressors. And uh, on occasions, if they are not amenable to uh, oxygen ventilation, inotrope vasopressor, you may have to introduce a short-term mechanical cardiovascular support like an intraatic balloon pump or sometimes even big pump. If there is an improvement in perfusion, well and good, you are on the right track. But if there is no improvement, so obviously then you will have to go to the mechanical side. You will have to think about a long-term mechanical cardiovascular support. So technically here we are talking about either an intraatic balloon pump or an ECMO or a VAD ventricular assist device depending on the left VAD, L VAD or right uh, R VAD if it's the right side. And then you may also have to think about the renal replacement therapy where you can potentially remove fluids, optimize the preload and see if the heart gets better with that. That's for cardiogenic shock. Um, so I'm going to skip this slide because this is something which we have dealt with. Uh, technically, this deals with the causes of failure. So it, almost always, as a first step in treatment, they want you to look at the cause of acute heart failure because that will be the most important step. And without doing that, you're not hitting forward at all. So look for acute coronary syndrome, look for an hypertensive emergency, look for arrhythmia. Try to do a rate control with them control. It can be as simple as an AF, which once treated, the heart returns back to its normal track. Look for mechanical causes like tamponade or um, valvular problems. Look for pulmonary embolism. Look for nasty infections, which can affect the heart, myocarditis, things like that. And look for tamponade. So technically, you're looking for a cause. That's the most important treatment. And whilst you're treating these patients, some of the um, uh, non-invasive semi-invasive and invasive monitoring modalities. The ones that uh, we regularly use here is PICO, which is uh, pulse-invasive uh, counter-analysis. 
continuous cardiac output monitoring. There are many uh, centers which uses uh, a pulmonary uh, swan gans catheter. That is something which uh, is used predominantly in the cardiac centers. Anesthesiological echocardiogram is something which is again uh, semi-invasive. It can be used, but the problem is the probe has to be put inside the esophagus and taken out every time. Now and then it can be damaging. Then there is the modern ones, which is more flow track and vigilio, which gives you a continuous cardiac output measurement. So basically, all these monitoring devices will give you an idea about the cardiac output. Will give you an idea about the intravascular volume and the vascular resistance. So at some point, it tells you whether the patient requires fluids or the patient requires an inotropic agent. It tells you, oh, it's not the fluid. The fluid is okay. It's the heart which is not contracting properly. Then you have to give an inotropic agent. Or is it the peripheral vasodilation? It tells you, no, no, the fluid is okay. The heart is okay. It is vasodilation. You need to give vasopressors. So a lot of times that is your question. Does this patient need fluids or an inotropic agent or a vasopressor? Most of these devices will give you numbers which helps you add up the clinical features along with the numbers and get an idea what these patients require. So to put everything into a nutshell, any patient who comes into your intensive care or your operating theater or your emergency department with a heart failure, you look at three different phases of treating them. In the immediate phase, try to identify the etiology. Look for the cause, treat the cause, and then try to optimize them and optimize the oxygenation and then optimize the end organ failure. That's the immediate part. The intermediate part, you have to ensure that the cause is treated properly, fully, and then you start titrating the treatment and ensure that these patients move from the acute to the less acute setting, from the intensive care to the ward with the continuation of care. And last term is the pre-discharge and the long-term care where you optimize the treatment before discharge in such a way that they go home and have a stable period and prevent readmissions or rehospitalizations. Now, some of the treatment that we commonly use, there is not many treatments available when it comes to acute heart failure. It's diuretics, inotropes, vasopressors, vasodilators, NIV. That's all. There are only four pharmacological agents that can be used. Sorry, three. Inotropes or uh, inotropes or vasopressors, vasodilators, diuretics, and then other than that, there is NIV. Now these are the only four treatment which can be used for any patient who comes in acute heart failure. You have to identify the uh, category of heart failure, and you'll have to balance these things. And if these things do not work, you go to the machines, the mechanical cardiovascular support, renal replacement therapy, and all that. Okay. With the diuretics, the recommendation is if they are already on oral di diuretic, then you double the dose of the diuretic and give it to them as IV. If they are not on any diuretic when they present to the ER with a wet phenomena, you give somewhere around 40 milligrams of fluspine and see how they affect us. Technically, what you're looking at is a urine output of greater than 100 ml per hour. Then you aim, you have a target. How much do you want to get them negative by? Let's say you want them negative by 2 liters in the first 24 hours. Based on that, you titrate your diuretic dose. If you get 100 ml per hour, by the end of 24 hours, you should get 2.4 liters. And then, which means you have to look at the amount of fluid you are given, and then all you negative by 2 liters. So based on that, you will have to increase your diuretic dose. A rough idea of how to start is, if they are already on diuretic, double the dose. That's your starting dose. If they are not on diuretic before, you start with 40 milligrams of IV fluids. This is just one recommendation which comes from European Society of Cardiology. There are numerous ways of dealing with this. Some people put people on diuretic infusions, fluzmat infusions, and it works really well. But all you have to do is monitor them very closely so that you achieve the ne desired negative balance by the period that you want to achieve. That is with the diuretics. The recommendation is very strong for diuretics, especially the loop diuretics. And if these patients are resistant to root diuretics, the recommendation is to add a thiazide diuretic and see how the response is. Now, when you add a diuretic, it helps the two systems. It improves the pulmonary congestion, alveolar edema, excuse me, and thereby improves your oxygenation. So it helps the lungs. And in the heart, it decreases the preload. 
So your left ventricular endiastic volume and your left ventricular endiastolic pressure is decreased. So the heart is happier, there is lesser ventricular stress and so the contractility improves and thereby finally the renal function also improves. So your heart health, heart is healthy, your lung is healthy and finally the kidney is also healthy with the diabetic. The next support, the most important thing is the respiratory support. When it comes to the respiratory support, the recommendation is any patient with a saturation of less than 90% should be introduced on some sort of oxygen support. NIV is a gold standard for these patients who present with a dyspnea, tachypnea, and uh, especially when the oxygen is less than, the saturation is less than 90%. Um, of late, HFNC has also been tried. The only difference between NIV and HFNC is that NIV helps with both carbon dioxide component washout as well as oxygenation, whereas HFNC deals exclusively with the oxygenation. It depends on what patient you are dealing with. It's almost always wise to start with NIV and then once you start seeing signs of improvement, you can work down and start HFNC on these patients. <clears throat> Again, like the diuretic, it has its effect, uh, a good effect on two organ systems. With the lungs, it increases your tidal volume, it improves your uh, pulmonary edema and thereby improves your oxygenation with the lungs. With the heart, it decreases preload, NIV decreases the afterload and thereby it makes the heart happier and contract better. So that's the non-invasive. The third thing, so diuretic, very useful, non-invasive ventilation or HFNC, very useful. And the third important drug is vasodilatase. Now here, uh, in this particular curve, the sorry, the x-axis deals with the afterload or your systemic vascular resistance. Now this is the stroke volume. So when a normal heart, when the blood pressure increases or your afterload increases, because the heart is normally contracting, the stroke volume does not fall. It just remains the same as a plateau. But then you have a failing heart. Now let's see there is a severe dysfunction. The LV is already struggling to contract and pump the blood out. When the blood pressure increases, obviously it is struggling to pump against a higher blood pressure, a higher afterload, and the stroke volume steadily declines with an increasing afterload or an increase in systemic vascular resistance. Now, this is where the vasodilators come into play. When you decrease your afterload, you make the life easier for your left ventricle, makes the contractility better, and thereby the stroke volume can improve. The commonly used medications are nitroglycerin, sodium nitroglycerin, or a neseritide. There is no evidence to say that one is better than the other. And introduce one of these medications only when your systolic blood pressure is greater than 110. Uh, the ideal candidate for um, a vasodilator therapy would be the ones with a wet and warm profile. This category, as we know, the vast majority of these patients are uh, wet and warm category, more than 90%, and ensure that your blood pressure is greater than 110. And then the last group of medications, the inotropes. The inotropes, um, based on the mechanism of action, we have beta receptor agonists, which is dobutamine. We have digoxin, sodium potassium pump. Uh, we have phosphodiesterase inhibitors, which is milrinone and enoximone. And then calcium sensitizer, which is levosimented. So these are the most commonly used inotropes. Even digoxin is not very common. It's almost gone out of work. Uh, more of a long-standing chronic heart failure medication than the acute setup. These three, uh, beta agonist, dobutamine, PD inhibitors, phosphodiesterase inhibitors like milrinone, and calcium sensitizers like levosimented are the ones which are most commonly used in the acute setting in an intensive care unit for those patients who come in with heart failure. Um, yeah, these are the drugs basically. And um, each and every drug have their own advantage and disadvantage. I'm not going to go into the details of the pharmacology of these drugs. Um, the, so technically, dobutamine is the most commonly used drug. So anybody who comes into the ER ICU gets started with dobutamine because of its inodilator property. Mildenone has a specific effect on the pulmonary vascular system. In addition to having an anotropic effect, they are also pulmonary vasodilators. So it seems to be a little more preferred for uh, the right-sided heart failure because there is pulmonary vasodilation and as a result, the, it improves the function of the right ventricle particularly. Levosimendin is a very good drug. It's got a longer duration of action. So you load your patients with levosimendin. Technically, the effect can last for one week to 10 days also. And those patients who are already on beta blockers, 
Dubutamine might not work very well. Levismentin has a completely different mechanism of action. So in these patients, Levismentin is a preferred drug. A lot of our cardiac patients, when they come in with failure, they're already on beta blockers. So at this point, Levismentin might be a good choice. So they have their own advantages and disadvantages. So anotropic agents, yes, they are very good drugs. But then there is a very specific indication. Um, gone are those days where any patient who comes in with heart failure gets stamped up on an anotropic agent, like a dobutamine. Uh, put them on dobutamine, put them on dopamine. Those days are gone. There are specific reasons why you want to put these patients on anotropes because very much like their good effects, there are a lot of bad effects from anotropes also. So the recommendation is that you put them on anotropes only when the systolic blood pressure is less than 90 and when there is evidence of hypoperfusion, which does not improve with your standard treatment, including fluid challenge. So not all patients. You should have a few boxes ticked. The systolic blood pressure should be less than 90. And after your standard treatment of fluid and all that, there should be signs of hypoperfusion. What are the signs of hypoperfusion? Cold, clammy peripheries, capillary refill time greater than 3 seconds, lactase greater than 2, signs of end organ problems like acute kidney problem, oliguria, signs of uh, liver problems. So these are end organ perfusion signs. And only if you have any of these signs along with a low systolic blood pressure of less than 90, you start them on inotropes because inotropes increase your heart rate. They are bad drugs. They can cause arrhythmias. They obviously increase your myocardial oxygen demand. Your heart is already struggling without enough oxygen. By flogging the heart further with inotropes, you may cause more damage. They can also have a direct toxic effect to the heart. And there are many studies which has been done on the effect of inotropes and the routine use of these patients have found to be detrimental. So no routine use of inotropic drugs for heart failure patients. There are specific indications. Systolic may be less than 90 per organ perfusion. These are the only two times. Okay. So these are the patients, those patients who come out wet and cold with these boxes ticked that I mentioned already. You should you choose, you use it for the shortest term possible, you use the lowest dose possible. And there is no evidence to say that one agent is better than the other agent. Whichever you are comfortable with, either dobutamine or melrinone or levosimentin, you can use it. That's not a problem. Moving to device therapy, when would you use a renal replacement therapy? The indications are standard. There is no routine use of ultrafiltration. The standard reasons is to decrease the fluid overload when there is a diuretic resistance, when there is a severe hyperkalemia, severe metabolic acidosis because of the renal failure, urea, uremic encephalopathy, uremic acidosis, and a creatinine value. Usually, creatinine value is not a great indicator, but the other ones, especially fluid, hyperkalemia, acidosis, and urea, these are indications for renal replacement therapy. And these are standard indications anyway, even without an acute heart failure problem. When it comes to the other mechanical assist devices, IABP is something which is relatively commonly used in a lot of cardiac centers with patients present with acute coronary syndrome, like a heart attack, MI, along with a cardiogenic shock. But that said, um, in cardiogenic shock, it's got a decent evidence. But beyond that, uh, IAPP does not seem to improve outcomes in some of the trials. So it is still a big question. Um, but it is one of the useful tools. And then left ventricular assist devices, mostly as temporary devices or a bridge to transplant. Whereas these patients have a permanent heart failure, end stage heart failure, they have to be transplanted. And during the waiting time, they can have a left ventricular or a right ventricular assist devices. Um, my slide is not moving. Yes, it's not moving. Yeah. Not able to control it. Almost done with the presentation here anyway. Yeah, move too fast now. Anyway, so
So technically, uh, there are scoring systems to understand the um, uh, in-hospital and out-of-hospital mortality for these patients. So acute heart failure patients can be scored with this IDR score or ELAN HF score. These are two popularly used scores to understand how these patients are going to fare with your treatment. And uh, to put everything in a nutshell to consolidate, the most important treatment for these patients is treat the cause. Why do they come in with a heart failure? Go after the cause first. And once you address the cause, then the next important thing is relieve the symptoms of congestion and the low output state. Once you relieve the congestion and low output state, and then how to have these patients in a stable condition, and these drugs should be introduced to stabilize them before discharge. So this is the most important step which prevents the admission of these patients to the hospital. Um, educating the patient and the family is a very important step and uh, that's all my talk is about. And almost all the information and evidences that I have put in this slide has been borrowed from the European Society of Cardiology and the American Heart Association. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Rajesh, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. It's an excellent talk. And uh, sir, a lot of uh, information. And we have some queries sir, to take up. Uh, shall I start with the question, sir? Uh, please, sir. Uh, sir, uh, th uh, this forum has a lot of uh, MDPGs. Sir. So the questions are related uh, from to that. Uh, role of dopamine, dopamine versus dobutamine in cold and dopamine. Dopamine. Uh, the dopamine. problem with dopamine is that dopamine is a very commonly uh, used drug uh, in our part of the world, but um, because of its side effect profile, because of its side effect profile, especially in the form of tachycardias and arrhythmias, in the adult population, it seems to have gone out of work, sir. In the adult population, um, the biggest strength of dopamine, uh, the reason still we are still talking about it is that. It does not cause a vasodilation. That's the advantage of dopamine. Whereas the other available inotropes like dobutamine, melrinone, levosmedin, all these, in addition to having an inotropic effect, they are also dilators. So a patient who's got a borderline blood pressure, when introduced dobutamine or melrinone, I expect a blood pressure drop. So a lot of times I end up adding a vasopressor, a noradrenaline along with that. Now I'm on two drugs now. Whereas if I add dopamine, at least I don't have the dilator problem. But that said, dopamine carries lots of arrhythmias. So as a result, people are shying away from using dopamine in the adult population. It is still a very popular drug as an inotropic agent in the pediatric age group, but not on the adult side. Sir. There has um, been a few studies which looked into the dopamine and the outcome and all that. And there is not a favorable profile for dopamine, and people are shying away from using it. Sir, uh, opinion on ionodilators like mildenone and levosimendan instead of uh, NTG and SM? Uh, uh, the most important question, again, as we saw in the algorithms, is that do you have both a pulmonary congestion as well as a perfusion problem, sir? That is the most important question. When there is pulmonary congestion alone, pulmonary edema alone, the choice would be a combination of diuretic and a pure vasodilator, like an NTG. So, if there is a combination of pulmonary edema as well as a perfusion problem, that is when you want to add an inodilator. Now, the reason I don't want to add an inodilator for the first category is, as I said, all these inotropes have a, a very bad profile with the heart. They increase the heart rate, they cause arrhythmias, they increase the myocardial oxygen demand. Dobutamine, melrinone, levosimendan, enoximone, all these drugs have a very bad profile when it comes to causing heart rate, worsening, arrhythmias. And so I don't want to give these drugs who do not have a perfusion problem. If they have a perfusion problem, yes, definitely I will give it. So, which means that for pulmonary edema alone, I will only use a vasodilator and a diuretic. But if there is pulmonary edema and poor perfusion, I will add diuretic plus an inodilator. So, how early we can go for uh, MCS, uh, mechanical cardiac 
how sorry how early, early, early how early we can go for in heart failure it's mostly for treatment resistance sir it's mostly for treatment resistance so it depends on uh, how well you are how soon you are able to ascertain that your routine pharmacological and your other mechanical supports like renal replacement therapy and iabp have failed there are occasions where we take care of patients in the cath lab these patients come in with a severe acute coronary syndrome and a severe cardiogenic shock while we are doing catheterization while we are trying to revascularize them they can arrest and while we do see insert an iabp sometimes we insert an ecmo also there how soon as a few minutes to one or two hours we introduce ecmo but then there are patients who are not that sick who don't crash but who do not improve over a period of one or two days then we understand that we have exhausted all the standard measures the patient is not improving then it's over a period of one or two hours we realize that this patient is not uh, amenable to standard treatment then we go on ecmo so it all depends on how soon you are able to assert it if i have a patient who is crashing on the table in the cath lab within the next half an hour we will introduce even ecmo sir sir uh, role of uh, digoxin and morphine in heart failure morphine is definitely uh, uh, a drug which is uh, i would call it as a rescue drug especially being a, co- a combination of an anesthetist and intensivist uh, i love administering morphine for my patients for two reasons when they come in with acute coronary syndrome and lot of pain i see that morphine works better than fentanyl a lot of occasions when it comes to pain alleviation and then when it comes to uh, stabilization of my sympathetic nervous system definitely morphine is much better than fentanyl this is my personal opinion so i can't quote any studies over here and uh, it definitely breaks down my sympathetic response and uh, it's got a very favorable profile with the heart so morphine is a wonder drug i'm sure then you have to ensure that it doesn't compromise your respiratory system because a lot of times these patients come with pulmonary edema as well you have to be very cautious in your administering and uh, digoxin yes uh, my most common use for digoxin these days is for rate control in atrial fibrillation than for cardiac failure itself uh, there are patients who are resistant to routine management of atrial fibrillation we put them on beta blockers optimize their electrolytes we start them on amiodarone doesn't work. then we take up digoxin as a rescue drug more for rate control uh, even with the cardiologist fraternity too that seems to be Uh, a much more common indication for digoxin than a uh, uh, than as a drug for long term cardiac failure uh, treatment unfortunately at this point of time all the available evidence for digoxin says that it doesn't improve mortality but it can improve quality of life so still is being used by the cardiologist as outpatient therapy and we don't do digoxin levels regularly that's another problem sir uh, some questions related to anesthesia so in pre anesthetic uh, evaluation is there any criteria for echo criteria to get the patient uh, fit for elective surgeries for pico nico yeah, echo echo is there any uh, criteria in the echo uh, echo cardiogram findings to get the patient fit for elective surgery fitness for uh, i think i didn't understand the question can you rephrase it No, no. It has been asked like in PAE, is there any any criteria for the echocardiogram to be done during pre-anesthetic evaluation that the, to get the patient to be fit uh, for elective surgery? That's a question from Dr. Prema. If, uh, if I take this question as what the patients who should require an echocardiogram in the pre-op assessment period, then uh, uh, my thing is that there are uh, really in the current condition there is no specific uh, uh, you know uh, criteria. if my patient goes in for a major surgery and which would which would probably uh, warrant a postoperative intensive care which is a surgery which can particularly jeopardize the cardiovascular system you know a lot of times we have young patients who go in for hypex surgeries and in the perioperative period because of the therapeutic agents because of the fluid shift we expect a lot of cardiovascular uh, changes in the perioperative period so i would like to have a baseline so even in the younger age group if it's a major surgery i ask for echocardiogram and then in the relatively older age group uh, we have a very low threshold to ask for an echocardiogram if there are slightest of the symptoms unfortunately a lot of our patient population don't go in for rec- a regular evaluation so a lot of times when during the pre op assessment there is incidental findings 
wherein you do an echocardiogram as a routine thing, you identify there are major problems. So my practice over the last few years of coming back to India has changed dramatically where well. I think I'm probably asking for ECMO on almost 60 to 70 percent of the patients beyond the age of 60 years. Uh, I guess it's just we have to be very sensitive to the uh, clinical examination and have a low threshold to ask for ECMO. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. There are some more questions in chat box because of the time lag. Uh, I'll, I'll message you the questions and I'll get the answer from you in the chat box. Pleasure. Sorry. Thank you, thank you Sabha, sir, for your uh, spending your uh, valuable time with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. So we will uh, move on to the uh, next session. Uh, uh, session number two by the How do I safely ventilate my patient in OT? Uh, by Professor uh, Dr. P. R. Chandrasekhar, sir, who is the head, Department of Critical Care Medicine, uh, IGOT, Bangalore, Karnataka. We welcome you, sir, and uh, for the lecture. Over to you, sir. Professor Chandrasekhar, sir. Over yes, to yes, you. yes, yes, sir. I'm trying to share my slides. Just give me a second. Are my slides uh, visible, sir? No, sir. Uh, no, no. So? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Visible. Okay. Yes, sir. Visible, sir. Okay. Uh, you can see it. Uh, I would, uh, at the onset, I would like to thank Dr. Johnson and the anesthesia colleagues for uh, inviting me to do this uh, lecture. Uh, Mostly I do as uh, my previous speaker work mostly in the intensive care, but uh, my basic speciality is anesthesiology. So I did uh, take up this talk, how do I safely ventilate my patient in OT? If you look at the literature from uh, the Las Vegas study, uh, which was published in 2017, it's a huge study with uh, nearly 10,000 patients. 38 countries, 146 centers, mostly in US and Europe. India was not included. What they found was tidal volumes were reasonably okay. The amount of PEEP that most of the anesthesiologists are using is very less. About 32% is using less than 2 centimeters and about 60% of them are using about 2 to 5 centimeters of water. And uh, about uh, less than 10% are using recruitment maneuvers. So, there is a good focus on low tidal volume ventilation, but the amount of PEEP used is very low and there is no recruitment maneuvers. See, these are, one of, these are the few best centers in the world. I am sure, very much sure that if you do a similar kind of survey in India, probably tidal volume also usage is much higher because I do interact with a lot of anesthesiologists and for them about 9-10 ml is the normal. So, having looked at the way the world is ventilating, there is a lot of scope for us to learn how to ventilate our patients safely. So, the next obvious question is why do we ventilate uh, our patients undergoing surgery? Most of the times, it could be a patient's choice or the surgery warrants GA. And another common misconception that every anesthesiologist carries is that my lungs are normal. So, whatever for a short duration of one to two hours, if I ventilate with higher tidal volumes or less PEEP. And uh, another uh, common uh, thing that I hear from anesthesiologists is that PEEP produces blood pressure. That is something every anesthesiologist, there is a strong uh, kind of a rooted belief that PEEP causes hypotension. This is what most of them uh, have a belief or a myth. So, having thinking that you have a normal lung and trying to induce the, or ventilate the way with higher tidal volumes, low PEEP, doesn't do much good to the patient because most of the studies are showing that the post-operative pulmonary compli complications in different studies go up from 7% to 40-50% and in some high high uh, centers operating major cases like in cardiothoracic centers and in uh, our center, I'll show you a, a statistic that we have found out. 
we have very very high incidence of post operative pulmonary complications what what constitutes post operative pulmonary complications would be most commonly though there are some additions i would say what we see is respiratory insufficiency failure atelectasis pneumonia and bronchospasm these are mostly what we see sometimes pleural effusions and uh, uh, rare, rare complications we do see but these are the four which we commonly see and when somebody has this ppcs there is a increased morbidity the length of the stay increases the economic burden increases and the mortality increases added to this in the post operative period there is always a pain component that also we have to factor in which also again contributes to patient not taking very deep breaths not having not cooperating with uh, uh, physiotherapy incentive spirometry good cough uh, maneuver so this also in the post operative goes to the post operative period the way we ventilate the patients intraoperatively he is what accounts to how well the patient behaves post operative this is what we have to understand it is not enough that we ventilate somebody with good saturation a decent amount of uh, etco2 and send them out of the theater and think my job is done it doesn't because most of the anesthesiologists in most of the medical colleges and centers now are managing the intensive care units also so the impetus should be on ventilating with a lung protective ventilation which i'll be discussing because we want to minimize or in fact avoid post pulmonary complications so the question is do always to all our patients have normal lungs look at here a 40 year old guy with four day old perforation peritonitis already requiring 50 liters of oxygen on a non rebreathing mask his saturations are 95 is getting almost like 100% of fio2 and his spo2 if you look at the spo2 fio2 ratio it almost lands up into a severe ards his respiratory rates are high then is restless post act for emergency laparotomy urine output is very quick so do you think that ventilating this guy with a high tidal volume low peep would do because he already has a tendency to go to ards because there is a gram negative sepsis and if you then you don't ventilate this patient with a lung protective ventilation that becomes a second hit to the lung and the patients tend to develop ards probably partly because of the disease and partly because we have not put, we have not done the ventilation with a lung protective uh, framework see this is something you have to keep don't think that every lung that you get is normal look at this patient we have a normal young lady pregnancy then she goes into pph not responding to drugs we have one unit of blood we transfuse we are organizing blood then pushing a lot of uh, fluids then we get we it goes into a massive transfusion uh, transfusion protocol see a normal lung can become abnormal on the theater so the bottom line what i want to underscore is three things one every patient even with a normal lung is known to get into a ppc so it is better to institute a lung protective ventilation sometimes you may get bad lungs or a uh, grade one or a mild ards on your table and the third one is we don't know any any patient can go into a situation where the lung from being good can become a lung which is which is which is prone for ards in the post operative period so my one take home point is don't think the patient's lung is normal even the lung which is normal can produce a post pulmonary complication so the, 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 that is what i want the younger colleagues of mine to understand that every patient who gets on to your table under general anesthesia and mechanical ventilation has to be instituted a lung protective ventilation in our unit because we operate complex gs surgeries when we do ultrasound on the first post operative day or immediately post operative day almost i would say every patient has a basal collapse and some b lines the upper portions will show a lines but most of our patients show basal on the pal point generally show b lines with lot of collapse so this is not something that is what you have to think is because we have been seeing from so many years that every patient 
has atrial ectasis. Though we do have lung protective ventilation in our unit, we have implemented it, but still we get into a lot of uh, patients with atrial ectasis. So some, this is, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problem that we have to accept. It is there. It is there. So most of my uh, uh, material that are the information I'm going to give is based on this article. This is one article published. These are most of the uh, guys involved are uh, from the Las Vegas study group from US and uh, Europe. And it's a good paper. I recommend most of the, all the postgraduates to have this paper in your uh, uh, desktops or laptops and keep it as a reference for us to, for you to keep updating the uh, practice, anesthesia practice and mechanical ventilation. So the obvious question is, as I said, uh, in our unit, as patients are elderly and most of them have atrial disease, is there a way to assess who, which patients are more prone for uh, having uh, post uh, PPCs? So there are a lot of uh, scores like uh, the Ariscat Aris scan uh, score, uh, Gupta score, and uh, Arizula score. But uh, my personal experience with scoring systems are. There are too many scoring systems, so generally we don't tend to really sit and spend so much time assessing the patient. This is what happens. So probably the consensus group also felt so. So they have come up with very, very precise and very easy to see where it is so obvious that these patients are more prone for PPCs. This is very obvious. Anybody having a BMI of more than 40, age of more than 50 years, physical status of ASA more than two, sleep apnea, and COPD patients also, preoperative anemia, preoperative hypoxemia. As I said, COPD would qualify probably with hypo hypo hypoxia and hypercarbia, both emergency and urgent surgeries, because probably most of the times, like they will have some trauma or they will have some uh, lead to the lung already. That's why emergency and urgent surgeries are, these patients are more prone for PPCs. Ventilation duration more than two hours and intraoperatively anybody has hypotension, low SpO2s, probably these are the patients who have increased incidence of your post pulmonary complications. It's very simple and you can remember this. This is not very difficult for postgraduates to remember and it is always better to optimize them preoperatively. There are some modifiable, modifiable risk factors, some things you can't modify like age, you can't modify somebody's weight, probably you can ask them to go back, lose weight and come sometimes in emergency situation, it may not be possible in pregnancy with morbid obesity, we have to go ahead with surgery and cessation of alcohol, smoking, any treatment of uh, infections, especially in COPD patients and relieving of bronchospasm and also anemia, but probably how it uh, decreases PPCs, probably if somebody has anemia, we may have to use higher FIO2s, things like that. So that also can be uh, taken into account. Educating regarding physiotherapy probably is important because the patients in the post-operative phase, when we have counsel them and when they already know how to do incentive spirometry, they are more motivated. You can talk to them, you can educate them. We have seen this. The patients are more uh, kind of uh, cooperative to do chest physiotherapy and also incentive spirometry. So, in the next uh, few slides, I'm going to look at the respiratory physiology and mechanics for you to understand what happens in GA and why you should go for a lung protective ventilation. I've always learned that if a postgraduate learns the logic behind what we tell, why it has to be done, he does it better. If you just say, if I can just say in a, in a, in a slide that the tidal volumes have to be between six to seven, if everybody has to have a peep of five centimeters and you can do recruitment maneuvers and end my talk, it's not going to be of great help. I want them to understand what happens at the alveolar level and how to identify who requires adequate, uh, who requires uh, PEEP and how to personalize somebody's PEEP and which patients require uh, recruitment maneuver so that you will have a, because we, we do see a lot of different type of category of patients with different category of surgeries. So the combination of a acute stress imposed on a uh, patient with a decreased physiological reserve becomes 
sometimes tricky to manage the patients intraoperatively and postoperatively so understanding what really happens at the alveolar level is going to give you more confidence or more uh, grip over the management of tidal volume peep and recruitment maneuvers <laughs> See, this is what you have to understand. Lung doesn't expand by itself. Normally, we suck air in, but in a ventilator, we are going to push air in. And lung and chest wall are in a series. This is very, very important. You remember this. I will tell you, at times, when somebody has a high peak pressure and high plateau pressures, it is difficult, very, very easy to differentiate whether it, the contribution is from the airway or the lung. But sometimes, it becomes very difficult to differentiate whether it is contributed by the chest wall or the lung. But one uh, caveat I want to put it here is any chest wall difficulties are obvious. Like somebody has a pneumoperitone, somebody has a huge hernia being pushed in and stitched or reverse tendon bug position. So you know that there is a chest wall component that is hampering your diaphragmatic movement or the respiratory pump is being hampered. Then if your peak pressures and plateau pressures go up, probably you will not worry much because the alveolar pressures are not high in these situations. But clinically, exactly to point what contribution of the P2 or your uh, draining pressure is because of the alveoli or the chest wall is at times very difficult to make at the bedside. We'll see how well we can do it for a course of time clinically in the next few slides. And lung also has more alveoli here and more blood supply, less alveoli, less blood supply. So we have a PQ mismatch. On a superimposition, because of the superimposing, it's like keeping a wet sponge. When you keep a wet sponge, the weight of the over on the, this part of the lung is going to put pressure here. This we call it a superimposed pressure. This is more common in a sick lung because of alveolar edema. The lung weight is more, so the basis collapse. And that, that is the tendency for us to see in the palp point or in the basis, a lot of collapse. It's physiologically like that. In a supine position, under general anesthesia, the more there is more collapse and atelectasis at the base. That you have to understand. And another thing, what I want, this, this slide has been put up for you to understand that the tidal volume has been, tidal volume goes in and comes out on a volume that already exists in the lung. So that is called FRC. The tidal ventilation occurs over FRC. So, increasing the FRC by introducing PEEP is going to increase the surface area of the uh, alveoli which is in contact with the blood vessels. So, the oxygenation occurs better. And another advantage of increasing the FRC is you have more alveoli to accept the same amount of tidal volume. So, the pressures that you achieve are not very high. So, you have to, when we speak of tidal volume, don't always focus on tidal volume. Tidal ventilation occurs on FRC, the functional residual capacity. That's what I want you to remember. See, this is what I was saying. The transpulmonary pressure is what is the main determinant of VILI, the ventilator-induced lung injury. And ventilator-induced lung injury, the Transpulmonary pressure. See, there are two instances. One patient, both patients have a transpulmonary pressure of 30. Look here, this chest wall is very, very rigid. Chest wall is contributing 20 and alveoli is contributing 10. Whereas you look here, it's ARDS lung. It is contributing 25 and a chest wall is only contributing 5 centimeters for this pressure. This may happen even with the pressures we measure. A plateau pressure, a driving pressure, which I'll come. Don't worry I will explain it to you what it actually means, how to ascertain on the operating table and how to manipulate your ventilatory settings and parameters so that we know what are the uh, lung protective ventilation boundaries at, uh, for us to operate. What is the boundary with which we have to manipulate our ventilatory settings is what is the crux of the talk. So what I want you to understand is, if you see a plateau pressure or a PIP pressure of 30, it doesn't mean anything. The We don't know what is lung is contributing, how much is the chest contributing. For this, you have to put in an esophageal balloon so that you measure the pleural pressure and once you measure the pleural pressure, then you can separate the difference of what the chest wall is contributing, how much is the alveoli contributing. 
But the whole situation in an operating theatre, in most of the ICUs also, we don't do this. So, ascertaining the contribution of the chest is always clinically. We look at any rise in the intra-abdominal hypertension, any position changes, any pneumoperitoneum, obesity, any grass, edemas. This, are, this is what the chest wall contribution is. How you will ascertain? It is not possible to ascertain what is the contribution of the alveoli or the chest wall in the operating room. But it is quite obvious. Many times it is quite, quite obvious that when we intubate somebody, look at your PIP pressures and plateau pressures, then once on a laparoscopic patient, once the pneumoperitoneum occurs, if the pressures go up, probably you should not get worried. You should not get worried. You know because the diaphragm is not going up, the chest wall or the respiratory pump is contributing to the increase in the pressures. In such situations, you can be more bold, put up more peep. You can do a recruitment maneuver. But if you have a patient on supine, uh, at the uh, beginning of the surgery, uh, PIP pressure is only 15. Suddenly, he develops pulmonary edema. There is a pink frothy sputum coming out of the endotracheal tube. Then you know it. the contribution is from the alveoli, not from the or the patient has aspirated, then you know the chest wall has not contributed, it's more. Then you have to be very careful. Those are the patients who go for ARDS and it's very difficult to manage in the post-operative situation. As I said, the transpulmonary pressure, to do this, you require esophageal balloon. We generally don't do. We don't do the FRC estimation also. Some ventilators do give FRC, but most of the anesthesia ventilators may not have it. So we generally know only the tidal volume. So we use surrogates here. What are the surrogates we use to look at the pressures? We use the PIP pressure, we, have, we look at the plateau pressure, we look at the driving pressure and we look at the positive end expiratory pressures. These are the four pressures you should know. Without knowing these four pressures, you are not doing a justice to your patient. And it is not accepted in a present day anesthesia practice that if you don't note down the PIP and plateau and the driving pressure at the onset of anesthesia, you are not doing a good job. This is the standard of care in all the centers in the world. I will explain it, how to get there and what it all means to. So what from this slide, I want the postgraduates to understand two things. The best pressure to look at is transpulmonary pressure, which you require to float a esophageal balloon. There are a lot of technical issues. In most of the Indian ICUs also we are not doing. So we use the surrogates. The surrogate pressures are the PIP pressure, the plateau pressure, driving pressure. These are the three pressures that you have to know to know whether we are within the boundary of lung protective ventilation. You should always, always remember that oxygen delivery is not oxygen transfer to the, the blood, to the pulmonary blood is not the goal. For every anesthetist should remember this. You should always think that Oxygen delivery to the mitochondria is the goal and it's a cardio-respiratory function because we always focus on the macro circulation. We are fixed to macro circulation. So, this is something that you have to always consider whether my delivery and my requirement, is it sufficed? How to look at this? If the patient is not anesthetized, mentation, urine output, a capillary refilling time. It is very easy. At the bedside, you can do then if you have the ABG, then you can look at the lactate and SCVO2. This is what tells you whether your oxygen delivery for mitochondria is adequate or not. If whether your oxygen delivery is adequate to mitochondria. And it is a, it's a cardio-respiratory function. And it's a thoracic cage is a fixed structure. And any increase in the intrathoracic pressure always compresses your heart, decreases your preload, cardiac compression, decreased preload. Though it increases, it, it decreases the afterload, but the preload decrease is much more when the, somebody is fluid deficient. What I want you to understand is whatever parameter you change on the ventilator, always think that it might affect your heart. And if your blood pressure falls, you may have a PAO2 of 700, 500, but it's not going to reach your mitochondria because the perfusion pressures are not there. So, oxygen delivery to mitochondria is a cardio-respiratory function. Always remember that. And whatever 
you change on a ventilator always look at your hemodynamics and if possible in a long term long surgery you can always look at the lactates co2 urine output and your pco2 gaps those are easy to understand they do give information that something is happening at the cellular level or the microcirculatory level one thing you have to understand to understand the pressures as i said the surrogates of your frc and the transpulmonary pressures i said we have to look at three pressures one is peak inspiratory pressure the second one is plateau pressure and the third one is driving pressure to understand that you should know that alveoli is a cul de sac meaning that there is only one way the air gets in and gets out so when you put air into a closed space or a tidal volume into a closed space what increases can any post graduate type in the chat box what increases when you put volume in a closed space because i have about 3 4 case scenarios we will have one or two volunteer post graduates and discuss how to uh, set the ventilator so what increases if a volume is placed in a closed space Three, four messages. Okay, fine. That pressure increases, isn't it? Pressure increases. Obviously, pressure increases. Why size got stuck? And in which alveoli do you think uh, pressure increases more? In A or B? In A or B? Which pressure? Which uh, this thing? Uh, it increases more. Can anybody type? Which alveoli? In A alveoli or B alveoli? B is yes, obviously isn't it? And air always chooses the path of least resistance. Remember this; it's very important. It's a very important concept that you have to. The lung, even a normal lung in a supine position under general anesthesia, is heterogeneous. Not all alveoli has the same time constants. There are basal collapse, and the lung, the air always goes preferentially to more compliant lungs. So you have to understand that, and. because that we something happened ah yes so pressure increases okay volume change for a change in pressure is compliance for all practical purposes whenever you put a volume think that if your pressure goes up that the lung is stiff you we can use complicated words and i can make it more complicated saying that compliance reverse uh, inverse of compliance is less than for you and me when a volume gets into the lung i see a higher pressure my assessment is there is a problem with either the airway or my lung is stiffer or my chest wall is contributing to increase in pressure i will show you and i will explain it to you how to differentiate whether the contribution is from the airway or the lung and as i have said between the lung and the chest wall the only way is to float a esophageal balloon which we are not and most of the times under anesthesia it is very easy to ascertain whether the chest wall is contributing or the pump is getting restricted for movement that is what the chest wall contribution actually means so we have to monitor pressures you understand why we are looking at pressures because when volume goes into a cul de sac it produces pressures and there are three pressures which gives us the boundaries of lung protective ventilation one is can somebody type all the three pressures please so if somebody is asking me if pneumoperitoneum is there how to maintain a driving pressure of less than 13 i don't want to maintain a pressure driving pressure of 13 less than 13 that's what i mean to make you understand because the contribution is not from the alveoli the pressure is being uh, delivered by the ventilator to push your diaphragm down so you don't require you don't injure your lung at that situation so when somebody has hemoperitoneum pressure goes up you know it is you are pushing the pressure or pushing the you increase the pressure from the ventilator to increase or expand your respiratory pump that's what is the meaning what are the three pressures that we spoke of yes somebody has typed that is good no oh, sorry okay so those are the three pressures i'll i'll in the next few slides i will look into what what contributes 
So whenever the chat comes, uh, I'm getting it more difficult to start my slides again. Okay. So this is one important slide that every postgraduate uh, has to understand. See, we do a lot of settings. We say 6 ml. So then we set a peak. Then we set a respiratory rate. This is under our control. This is a volume or a intensive property. What does it go and meet? It goes and meets and we look at the plateau pressures, driving pressures, as I said, P PIP comes without doing anything. So three pressures will be ascertained. Whenever you start anesthesia, you do an inspiratory hold of two to three seconds. It works very good with volume control ventilation. And most of us use do use volume control. You can use pressure control also. There is no great difference between the two. But you should know how to uh, evaluate the plateau pressures and driving pressures in a pressure control ventilation. But in a volume control with a constant flow, if you put an inspiratory hold, if you, there, is, there will be a button, I'll show you on the ventilator, just hold it for two to three seconds, then probably you'll get a plateau and driving pressure. Then it goes and meets the alveoli. This is the capac capacitance property. See, the alveoli may be totally collapsed, may be normal. Then we get the Transpulmonary pressure, which we don't ascertain, then we look at the surrogates. These are the surrogates, PIP pressure, plateau pressure and driving pressure. You can remember the values. In anesthesia, we want to maintain the plateau pressures less than 16 to 17 centimeters of water, driving pressure less than 13 centimeters. Driving pressure, I'll tell you what it is in the next one or two slides. These are the surrogates. This is what we said when it goes and interacts with the capacitative capacitance property of the lung. Meaning, if somebody has an alveoli, all alveoli are open. So, the tidal volume goes to more alveoli. So, your pressures will be less. In this lung, the number of alveoli that are open are very less. And we do, we did understand that air always chooses the path of least resistance. So, the normal alveoli or your baby lung gets more distended. So, the pressure goes up. This is what I want you to conceptualize when you look at the pressures at the, in the, on the operating table. When you intubate somebody, put him on a volume control, set all the settings. First thing you mm. should see is the PIP, peak inspiratory pressure. If the peak inspiratory pressure itself is less than 15, 16, probably you know the lung is good. And if it is less or more, then do an inspiratory hold, you get a plateau pressure. And you minus from plateau pressure, the peak, you get the driving pressure. The values I have said is less than 16, less than 13. So this is what and how you start mechanical ventilation to every patient. This is because studies have shown us the boundaries of lung protective ventilation. We want to keep the lung within that boundary so that we don't produce post-pulmonary complications. See, if somebody is blowing to this, will the pressure increase more or to this? Obviously, when the number of alveoli which are capable of receiving your tidal volume is less, the pressure goes up. That is what I want you to conceptualize. Whenever the pressure goes up, you should think, is it, the, it is it contributed by my airway, my lung, my chest wall? As I have said, chest wall is easy because it doesn't acutely change. And we know whenever it changes, probably something has happened because of the position, pneumoperitoneum, a hernia surgery. Sometimes the surgeons may open up the abdomen like in liver transplant and put 30, 40 mops and there will be four, 10 retractors being pulled. So the diaphragm doesn't have space. When the pressure goes up, I know that it is being contributed by my diaphragm not being pushed. I, I don't mind increasing my plateau pressure to even 20, 25 in that situation, my driving pressure to 20 because I know lung is not getting hit. That is what I want you to understand. So these are the pressures and this is the and P plat is a surrogate of your end alveolar, end inspiratory alveolar pressure. It's a surrogate for your end inspiratory alveolar pressure. Remember that. See, this is the most important button on your ventilator. You should know this. There will be a, all of your anesthesia modern day ventilators has an inspiratory hold button. Whenever you intubate somebody, first look at your PAP pressures, then do an inspiratory hold of two to three seconds in a volume controlled and most of our patients will be paralyzed in anesthesia. 
most of our outpatients will be paralyzed though there is no question of uh, difficulty that we face in the critical care units where we don't want to keep them paralyzed for a long for you most of your paral- patients are paralyzed so it's very in- easy to do a inspiratory hold and what do you get you get plateau pressure driving pressure driving pressure is nothing but plateau pressure minus peep and compliance is tidal volume divided by driving pressure these are the three parameters you tend to look at the pip will be always be there whenever you see on the ventilator pip will be there so then you evaluate the plateau and the driving pressure then look at the compliance so what does it each mean what does each mean this is one important slide i want all of you to concentrate and remember that all your life to give a lung protective ventilation first you get pip to get plateau pressure what is the maneuver we do can anybody type in the chat box what maneuver should you do to get a can anybody type what is the maneuver that we do from plateau pressure from pip to get a plateau pressure it has to be in a volume controlled mode patient has to be paralyzed and the maneuver that we do is what yeah inspiratory hold somebody has type i'm happy that you understand that so then you get a plateau pressure what does plateau pressure signify it's a surrogate of end inspiratory alveolar pressure see this will include this will include both the the pip will include both the pip will include both the resistance component and the alveolar component or the compliance component so once you shift from pip to plateau the contribution is all by the alveoli and the difference between pip and plateau is called the trans airway pressure see when somebody when you intubate a asthmatic suddenly the peak pressure goes to 45 and if you do a plateau pressure plateau pressure will be 20 so the trans airway pressure will be 25 then you know the contribution is because of the airway and the difference between the plateau and peep is the driving pressure i'll tell you what it is see remember this remember this slide forever this is contributed by the airway and this is contributed by the alveoli from coming from here to here you have to put a inspiratory hold you have to put a inspiratory hold and the difference between this two is the contribution of the airway contribution of the airway whenever you see a high pip and a low plateau it is always because of the airway you need not worry i would go up and increase my peak pressures to 60 and ventilate my patient i am very much sure nothing will happen to my alveoli because all the energy is dissipated by stretching your or going through your narrowed airway the pressure goes there only it doesn't hit your alveoli so that is very easy once you do see whenever you suddenly see a patient difficult to ventilate just put a plateau pressure if the plateau pressure is low you can be very comfortable you can nebulize the patient you can deepen your anesthesia you can give ketamine you can give magnesium you can give your aminophilin you can nebulize because you know that it is because of the airway you don't require to auscultate also but i, I don't mean to say that you shouldn't auscultate but you can find find what is the contribution see what are the difference between the two pressures is the pip will include both the airway and the and the alveoli plateau will include only the alveolar pressure and driving pressure is the pressure that you require to put the tidal volume you require to put the tidal volume that is what see your plateau includes peak there is a static pressure also included in your plateau whereas in your driving pressure it is between the peak and the plateau so this is the pressure required to put the tidal volume so that is what tells you whether your tidal volume is adequate or not see when you put a tidal volume then suddenly you see the pl- 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 driving pressure going up obviously when the driving pressure goes up the plateau also goes up no doubt about it but that is the pressure you require to put the tidal volume into your lung that is what you have to remember which is which is the resistance uh, issue and which is the compliance issue see this is the this is the pip this is the plateau the trans airway pressure is bigger here or bigger here which which is this is the compliance issue 
This is the resistance issue. It's very easy to make out. Both the P plant and your driving pressure will be raised. Here, P plant and driving pressure will be normal. Or sometimes driving pressure may be more also. What you have to understand is that by looking at the small maneuver, you can differentiate whether the contribution is from the airway or the alveolar. So, to summarize, shall, I will ask you a few questions. How do you estimate P plat? What are the prerequisites that you should be there? Can somebody type it? In which mode do you do? Whether, whether the patient can be spontaneously breathing or not? And what is the maneuver you should do? And for how much time? See, if you hold the inspiratory, hold for more than few five, six seconds, you get a lesser value. Should not do. It should be always for two to three seconds, not more than that. Yes. So, all the questions have been answered. So, I will go ahead. Okay. Next. What does it signify? How do you calculate? Plat minus P. And it signifies the amount of pressure you generate when you put a tidal volume. That's what the driving pressure tells you. That's very, very important. I'll tell you why it is important in the next few slides. So, what does it mean to you? Pressure generated for tidal volume generation. And how do you estimate compliance? Tidal volume divided by driving pressure gives you the compliance. This is the lung stiffer complaint. Okay. In a pressure control mode, if somebody has a fancy that you feel that uh, pressure control mode has a better uh, flow pattern, so I use it is not very difficult. Once the PC, the pressure control level plus PP is equal to pla your uh, P plat, your pressure control minus your uh, P will be your driving pressure. So th this is easy to do. Whenever you look at your pressure control and your P, you get the P plat, and when you minus, you get the driving pressure. That's not very difficult at all. And whenever I'll just skip this slide. So, coming to what we have understood, now we have understood the boundaries of lung protective ventilation. We have understood the boundaries. What are the boundaries? One is the plateau pressure, one is the driving pressure. We know the boundaries on which you can set the settings. So, let us see how to set the settings now. These are the values. And I said, once you ascertain that the contribution of the chest wall is causing the increase in the pressure. This need not be respected. This need not be respected. You can go and have a plateau pressure of 25, 30. There is no problem. And a driving pressure of 20, 15, no problem. Because we know we require that much pressure to lift your chest wall up or push your diaphragm down. So whenever you have pneumoperitoneum or you have any reverse tendon bulk position, probably this need not be respected. So, what happens under anesthesia is the next question, isn't it? Why are our patients more prone for PPCs? Because in supine position, general anesthesia with neuromuscular movement, neuromuscular blockers, there is a cephaloid movement of diaphragm, basal atelectasis is there, and also surgical uh, issues that are pneumoperitoneum, positioning, circuit disconnection, probably reverse Tendlenburg position, sometimes even... Uh, a lot of mops, a lot of uh, retractors being used by the surgeons, hernia surgeries, huge hernias. When they put and uh, stitch uh, huge umbilical hernias, it is like putting two kgs into a one kg bag. Suddenly, the, the diaphragm finds it difficult to go down. So, all this happens during anesthesia. So, atelectasis occurs and there is reduced amount of alveoli and also you have alveoli with different time constants. So, two things you have to remember. In anesthesia, the number of alveoli open reduces and you get you make lung heterogeneous, meaning that, that we have alveoli with different time constants or which are more stiffer, more compliant. So, we have understood already that air always chooses the path of least resistance. So, it is an obvious deduction when alveoli are reduced and we have a lung with different alveoli with uh, different time constants, the one thing that you have to reduce is tidal volume. See, this is the understanding that you should have. In anesthesia, 
there is a reduced FRC and the alveoli collapse and alveoli collapse because of superimposing pressure, neuromuscular blockade and also because of the abdomen contents pushing your diaphragm up. So the basal alveoli find it difficult to find it difficult to uh, open up. So the air preferentially goes and overstretches the alveoli which are compliant. So the one thing that you have to do is reduce your tidal volumes. The tidal volumes that are accepted in modern day practice is 6 to 7 ml. Max is 8. So if you take back one message from this talk, I would ask you or urge you to have a practice of tidal volume setting at 7 and between 6.5 to 7.5 should be the range where you tend to maintain your tidal volumes. And the commonest thing everybody does is whenever somebody has hypoxia, increasing FiO2. Increasing FiO2 increases your oxygenation, but it does not improve your compliance. And also it makes you more, it makes you less vigilant to the problems that are occurring. So you always don't increase FiO2. That is one thing the younger colleagues have to remember that FiO2 is the last thing we increase. Maybe in a crisis situation we increase. But whenever there is a fall in SpO2, always think, can I increase my P? Can I do a recruitment maneuver? Not increase the FiO2. Because by increasing the FiO2, you are not changing the compliance, meaning I am not opening up the newer alveoli. The tidal volume is again going to the compliant alveoli and pressures will go up. That's not the way to work. And prolonged usage of 100% oxygen also causes absorption at electrosis. And this also should be followed in the post-operative. The commonest thing I see is every patient in the ICU should have 100% FiO2 with 10 or 12 liters of 100% SpO2 with 10 or 12 liters of FiO2. This is a common practice. That's, not, that's a very wrong thing to know. Whenever somebody has an oxygen FiO2 a flow of 2 liters, if you increase it to 3 liters, you should presume, assume or find the cause that something has happening at the alveolar level. You just increase the FiO2, then you will handle the patient only when the patient is in a collapse stage. So, FiO2 is a very dangerous thing to use injudiciously in anesthesia. That is the two second point of take-home take message for the postgraduates. FiO2, whenever you increase in acute crisis situation is fine. Otherwise, always play around with PEEP and recruitment maneuvers. And because of the Reduced FRC, there is reduced number of alveoli to handle your FiO2, your tidal volume, your small VT has to be done. That is the two take-home messages from this slide. So the first thing is reduce and second thing is you should see the, the, the lung, you should not set the tidal volume according to weight. It should be always the predicted weight. I am very sure that none of us do the formula calculate in the pre-operative rounds. See, at least do this. To measure the patient's height, remember this. This is a rule of thumb. It works well. I would be very happy that if you set tidal volume according to the, the height of the patient. And once you ascertain, set it for that. If you guess somebody's weight, if you, it is very, very criminal. The whole purpose of lung protective ventilation goes. And doing and looking at the uh, driving pressure is by uh, tells us whether the tidal volume what I am giving is appropriate to the number of alveoli I have. If the number of alveoli, if I roughly set something and if my pressure goes up, you should think that for a number of alveoli, there is overstretching that is happening. So this will cause post-pulmonary complications. That is what you have to analyze when you look at the pressures. Second is P. See, PEEP is something, PEEP works like this. It increases the FRC, increases the surface area, better oxygen. See, PEEP is a de-recruiting force. It's not a recruiting force. It is a maneuver that works in the expiratory phase, not in the inspiratory phase. That is something the postgraduate miss and it works by increasing the transpulmonary pressure. So, it affects all the alveoli, both the normal alveoli and abnormal alveoli. But... Once you increase the FRC, there will be some alveoli which will open and close during the normal tidal ventilation. The number of alveoli doing that will be reduced. And another thing is, once the alveoli, newer alveoli open up, the surfactant monolayer spreads, the compliance improves. And also, 
we use in pulmonary edema because it pushes the fluid to the interstitium. So for all patients, remember this: the PEEP has to be five, and don't think it affects your tidal volume. If at all, if it affects your tidal volume, it is all because of low fluid status. Maybe because of the anesthetics, a lot of vasodilatation has occurred. Your anesthetics may be contributing. Just push up some volume, but always try to ventilate all your patients with at least a PEEP of five. Any ventilation less than five. is not acceptable in present day practice so then from there you have to take it forward and do it in a individualized manner see somebody uh, goes into a pneumoperitoneum the spo2 falls i, I would increase my peep to uh, 8 9 10 11 12 i don't mind increasing my peep because i know my diaphragm is not going down so that is how you individualize or you see a very obese lady probably the uh, the chest is not easy to lift up so then you require more p and more frc so these spo2s are better so to visually understand how p works we want to have a ventilation from here to here we don't want the lung to collapse or over distend so this framework can be got by looking at your plateau pressures and driving pressures if you keep your plateau pressures less than 16 and your driving pressures less than 13 your lung will be ventilating from this part to this part from this part to this part we don't want the lung without peep the lung ventilates here then goes here and goes here this is what we call as atelectrotrauma a cyclical opening and closing causing atelectrotrauma and over distension we don't want this two to happen we want ventilation to happen here this happens only with application of peep not with the tidal volume should remember that because It's a de-recruiting force. Peep is a de-recruiting force. So recruitment maneuver is a sustained increase in airway pressure with the goal to open collapsed lung tissue. After which we apply sufficient peep to keep it open. The whole idea is the amount of pressure. See, if you think that by putting high pressure for a very short time you open up, because the surfactant surfactant monolayer spreads and uh, uh, it becomes more compact. so once you open up you don't require the same pressure to keep it open probably a peep of baseline of 10 if you add up another two do those a kind of a sustained small increase in pressure for a few few seconds has made more alveoli open and now that keeping it open is much easier so that is how the recruitment uh, maneuver works but the thing is you have to understand here also Air always chooses the path of least resistance. It is going to go and over distend your normal alveoli. That is the reason you have to do only when your peep doesn't work. Do a recruitment maneuver. Don't do recruitment maneuver for every patient. You have to manage it with peep or in any acute deterioration. Probably you can do a recruitment maneuver. Otherwise, always play around with peep. When peep doesn't work, you go and apply a recruitment maneuver. And as i said you you have to increase your peep otherwise the alveoli that you have opened up again collapse a lot of critical care erds studies have shown that it happens so so if your baseline is 8 do a recruitment you always increase your peep by 2 so keep it at 10 otherwise the work of the recruitment maneuver that work for a few seconds is not going to continue showing a similar result in a longer time frame these are some of the contraindications it's quite obvious uh, so you should not do recruitment maneuvers in this situation and whenever you do a recruitment maneuver as i have said it always hits the uh, normal alveoli but we do it because no maneuver is working so we do it so obviously two things are obvious for, it should be obvious at this level to all the post graduates that it has to be done only when your peep works and because it affects your normal alveoli it has to be done only for a short duration you cannot do uh, recruitment maneuver every 5 minutes or 10 minutes it doesn't it induces your normal alveoli you can do it only when it doesn't work so the easiest way to do is and as i said always watch your hemodynamics when you do a recruitment maneuver if you don't really look at your hemodynamics you may improve your oxygenation but delivery of oxygen to the mitochondria doesn't happen so that is the guideline that the uh, consensus committee produced they are they have not they have not recommended because for the obvious reason 
that it is going to affect your hemodynamics it is going to affect your normal alveoli you do it only when peep doesn't work and manual squeezing is not been advised because it is a 2 liter bag and i have seen the younger colleagues they get excited when the saturation falls they will be pumping in 2 liters for every tidal volume the lung will blow out and beyond the lung the heart doesn't pump any blood in that situation if you give it to your nurse you can be rest assured that she'll pump in 2 liters or 1 liter if you give a 1 liter back 1 liter will become your tidal volume so the easiest arm that we practice in critical care is just go to a pressure controlled mode increase the pressure control to 40 if it is a kind of a only lung situation if it is a obese or a chest condition you can go up to 50 60 cm a peep of 15 cm whatever the peep we have set forget it you set a peep of 15 cm a pressure control of 40 50 or 60 depending upon the patient situation it is only for 42 seconds most of the ventilators anesthesia ventilators modern anesthesia work stations have a button called recruitment maneuver can just press the recruitment maneuver this is what happens and after 40 44 seconds it comes back to the original tidal volume settings the only thing what you have to do is if your tidal volume setting is say 10 cm add up 2 cm there because the lung is not going to be open for a long time without increasing the peep and there are lot lot many methods of altering but with my 30 years experience i would say this requires lot of time and patience i am very sure that even in the icu my registers also won't do this if i ask them to keep on increasing weight for four breaths then look at your hemodynamics look at this that it's not going to happen so there is no studies saying that one is better over the other for beginners and post graduates a sustained inflation is what is very successful easy to implement so i would suggest that the post graduates learn one method once you become very convenient doing these things how well you can try the other methods also and in fact some buttons also have a side that also is a recruitment maneuver the pressure suddenly goes up for a while large tidal volume is delivered and again it comes back to the normal tidal setting but whenever you do a side and see a increase in the uh, spo2 decrease in the etco2 probably your peep has to go plus 2 from the baseline that is something you have to remember this is what it means it has to be individualized afterwards see which mode is better the committee says that there is no specific uh, recommendation but as an anesthesiologist and uh, looking at the way of ease of doing plateau pressures i would urge the beginners to ventilate most of the patients in volume control because plateau pressure measurement becomes easy and uh, in the las vegas study also 70% worldwide anesthesiologists were using volume controlled in anesthesia practice so no mode is definitely safer it is the settings that we set limits the place the alarm limits that we place like knowing that your uh, plateau pressure should not be more than 16 17 driving pressure should not be more than 13 that is the alarm and whenever changes occurs so how how you manage is what makes a mode safer just by putting a mode it doesn't appear it doesn't work safer there has been no recommendations on ie ratio but one is to two is good there has been no recommendation for uh, respiratory rate also anywhere between 18 12 to 20 should be fine the normal most of the anesthetists start try, try to increase the respiratory rate to a normal pco2 and for younger generation anesthesiologists normal is always 35 why do you want to push the carbon dioxide so low because during reversal during recovery emergency everything becomes difficult so carbon dioxide should be around 41 42 see to push it down you are putting more minute ventilation if you put more minute ventilation into the lung and if you want a saturation of 99 to every patient you can achieve it but you will have more ppcs that is what you have to target so induction there are few guidelines that they have quoted so on a head uh, elevated uh, 30 degrees and to avoid flat supine position if not contraindicated they say that you can apply a cpap a peep of uh, about 10 when somebody is uh, in a spontaneous uh, uh, respiratory thing and then thing, uh, you can put a nasopharyngeal airway if there is obstruction and after intubation it is always better to work with a fio2 of 0.4 and work more with peep and recruitment maneuvers rather than increasing fio2 two things three things oxygen toxicity 
absorption atelectasis and you always don't pick up the deterioration that is something you have to remember whenever you increase the fio2 so emergence again using less fio2 and uh, another thing commonly people do is to build up from 35 carbon dioxide they cut down the peep and stop the ventilation that's the worst thing you can do as an anesthesiologist you should never ever cut down the peep to zero and bring up the car carbon dioxide because we all know that carbon dioxide is a very very uh, aggressive stimulant of the respiratory system that's not uh, not but that leads to the maximum ppcs in fact if you use a uh, fio2 of 0.8% they say after extubation you put up some peep on a patient to prevent atelectasis and when you suck you always remember you don't remember remove only secretions you also remove air so your lungs collapse so before extubation always go on to a pressure support increase the peep to 10 to 12 cm for 3 minutes so that the atelectasis goes and then you can extubate another common way of looking whether your patient is fit for extubation is always ask him to cough three times if your peak cough expiratory flows are more than 60 probably you can extubate these are some things minor things which really makes a difference in a major surgery where putting after suction see when you suck you don't generally suck secretions you also suck air out isn't it all the air comes the lung collapses and suddenly you see the saturation drops then wait patiently put him on a pressure control even a volume control or a pressure control doesn't matter you wait for one or two minutes let him breathe nicely and let all the alveoli open then on a slightly head up position you can extubate the patient post operatively lot of issues are there like pain bed rest opioids so here a integrated multidisciplinary protocol is what is required so a lot of physiotherapies intensivists everything has to be coordinated and you can use nav and cpap or hfno if somebody was on that previously and you don't require to give everybody oxygen remember that and whenever you give oxygen give minimum oxygen whenever you increase oxygen you think what is happening at the alveolar level if you just look at your spo2 and try to ventilate patients you will get into trouble so how do you start mechanical ventilation intraoperatively this is something important always measure height or predictive body weight induction yeah. during less than fio to 40% cpap i would go with volume control ventilation my target is spo2 of more than 94% then i set what should be the tidal volume can anybody type what should be the starting peep what should be the starting ie ratio respiratory rate then you get pip it is already there on the ventilator then you should put a inspiratory hold look at the p plat driving pressure and then only the position change or pneumoperitoneum occurs if you don't do this then you don't know for what reason the pressure is going up or down so this is what you have to do for every patient it has to be a chart like this for every patient who is ventilated under general anesthesia then whenever you increase the peep or do your recruitment maneuver again recheck the plateau and drain pressure and your compliance if you don't see if something is happening not the way you anticipated then you should know that you are not opening new alveoli you are over stretching the already compliant alveoli then this doesn't work then you have to think different and always and whenever you see any change in spo2 and dt or co2 go back to your ventilator and look at your plateau pressures what was the pre previous plateau pressures what has it changed now and always keep a watch on the hemodynamics and another common mistake i have seen most of the younger colleagues of mine doing is see there is something called a pressure relief valve in all ventilators modern day see if you have set it at say 30 and if you intubate somebody and he goes into a bronchospasm and he starts developing a pressure of 45 50 then the air doesn't go to the lung it starts venting out and i have seen patients uh, my colleagues changing four five ventilators they would have rotated all the ventilators somebody will be ambuing and all the ventilators the only thing that you have to do is set the p max setting higher we set it 10 above the pip we normally on under anesthesia our pip range would be around 20 so we would set it at 30 but in a asthmatic because of the airway pressure if it goes beyond 30 the air comes out doesn't go into the lung so in that situation this has to be done remember this this is common mistake i have seen 
more time. So another thing you have to understand is height is what matters, not the weight. The lung size doesn't differ because somebody is obese. Lung size doesn't differ. So this is the formula. And then two is peak personalized. These are the boundaries. And peak in an obese lady can be around 17 to 12, or a man can be 17 to 12. It doesn't matter. Recruitment maneuver only when peak doesn't work. No ambuing and High FIO2 without PEEP may not prevent atelectasis. The last slide is, don't forget clinical examination. Don't think your, all your monitors is going to give information. I have, I have seen and in present day, most of the other side is, don't even wear a stethoscope. This is what is happening because they think gadgets will help. Always see the chest, hear the chest. I'm telling you, it gives a lot of information. Then is ventilatory parameters. Then is ETCO2. And SpO2, ETCO2 is a very, very good monitor because it gives you information on ventilation, circulation and metabolism. If uh, you want, in one of the classes, I can integrate how to manage your patients looking at your ETCO2 and any, uh, uh, what do you say, any alterations that occur around anesthesia looking at your SpO2, intra-arterial pressures. And ETCO2, if, uh, time, uh, if uh, Dr. Johnson uh, gives me more uh, lecture sometime after two months, I'll present a uh, talk to you how, how useful is ET, ETCO2. ETCO2 should be the uh, bread and butter for an anesthesiologist. If you give a, somebody gives a choice between SPO2 and ETCO2, always pick up a ET, ETCO2. It gives more information. So clinical examination, ventilator parameters, then the other things. So always remember the order. Then as we are looking at the transesophageal, transthoracic, ultrasound, ABG comes next. Okay. So if, if time permits, I have three case scenarios. If Dr. Johnson has time and the students are still keen to learn. So, uh, so you can you go, go ahead. You can go ahead. Just uh, five, ten minutes. Okay. See, peak pressure started showing 42 centimeters. So what do you do? And the patient is getting desaturated. How do you proceed? Can anybody type? What is the first thing you look at and do? What do you look at? Can somebody type? See, now patient is getting desaturated. Ah, increase the Pmax. To how much? I would, no, no. Mm -hmm. First is increase the Pmax, then only you can look at the P plat because no air is getting in. Air is going out, it's getting vented. So I would definitely go up to 60, Pmax of 60. I don't have a problem because I know. Now then look at the plateau. In plateau pressure, what do you what do you what do you, what do you expect? What will be the what will, what do you expect in the plateau pressure? It will be more or less what will be the difference between PAP and plateau? Yeah, the trans airway pressure will be high, the plateau pressure will be normal. Then absolutely you know it is because of the bronchospasm. You, don't, you should not get tensed in such situation. You increase the peak flows. You increase the... Wait, wait, wait. I'll come back. Okay? This is what you will see. So you know that it is a spasm. So how do you treat? I am very much sure most of the postgraduates are going to, if somebody sees a carbon dioxide of 75, I am 100% sure that every postgraduate will increase the respiratory rate and tidal volume. And if you do a ABG after one hour, carbon dioxide will be 100. So take my word, when I do the ARDS and COPD talk, I will show you how to manage and this is how you manage. You should reduce the tidal volume and respiratory rate. It may look counterintuitive because we have been taught carbon dioxide is inversely proportional to minute ventilation. It is a wrong statement for patients. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I think I overshot by 5-10 minutes. No so problem. Kindly excuse me. Kindly excuse me. Thank you, sir. Yeah. It's difficult uh, to search the questions in the chat box. Already uh, more answers. Uh, already, uh, already every question yeah, has been answered. Okay, okay, sir, we have taken up all the questions, sir. 
So we will, I think we can end the session. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for the excellent uh, talk, sir. Thanks and the uh, vote to Edward, sir. Excellent presentation, sir. We have not seen so much of uh, uh, physiology combined uh, intraoperative ventilation presentation. We have not seen anywhere, sir. It is uh, looking the ventilation through the prism of physiology of alvea, alveoli. So we have to go through your presentation once more to understand more. Sir. You can give it to you can give it yes. to our delegates, sir. You have already yeah. sent uh, your presentation to me. I will forward it to my participants. Thank you very much, sir. So Thank we are you. looking forward. Uh, you already said that uh, ETCO2 and ventilation in the interpretive period correlation. Yes, sir. We will have one more class uh, regarding that, sir. Thank yeah. you, Dr. Sir. We are looking forward to very interesting lectures in the coming weeks, sir. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Rajesh, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, one and all. I thank the uh, previous speaker also, and also I thank the uh, A1 Logics, the Anastasia TV, and uh, our uh, Akrula that is the sponsor. Thank you very much. We will meet the next week. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Rajesh. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We will wind up. Sir. Thank you.